Um, so thank you very much. So we're going to move on now to think about um, our next um, construct, which is um, critical sorry, <laughs> cultural humility. Thank you. I'm going to invite Marcel to come up to the table, to, to the podium, to introduce her conversation with, and I'm going to get this right or wrong, but Shoji. Joe, almost, she says, almost. There we go. That's probably the best I'm going to get. Um, I'm going to pass you over to Marcel to introduce that conversation. Thanks, Lynn. Um, my presentation or our presentation for this next section is about cultural humility, which I like to describe as a practice framework um, for working with diversity. Um, and I had a conversation with a wonderful professor here at the University of Sydney, Professor Chiorchi Ravulo, who's uh, working in the social work space. And um, I, I respect him as a real, you know, expert in the cultural humility space. So this is this next presentation is a conversation that Professor Chiorchi and I had um, on Zoom. Hello, Georgie, Professor Georgie. Um, I'm really happy to have you here today. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming from the Wijibal Waibal um, country in the heart of the Bundjalung Nation on the north coast of New South Wales, and uh, want to recognise their unceded sovereignty and their commitment to nurture and care for country and all who reside here in Bundjalung country. Um, and I extend that acknowledgement to the lands from which you're coming and, and all over Australia. Really. Um, so welcome. And may I ask you to please just briefly introduce yourself. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marcel. So Nissan Bulavanaka and G'day. My name is Chochua Vulo. I'm a professor and chair of social work and policy studies at the University of Sydney. And I'm joining from the unceded lands of the Gadigal people, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And I'm delighted to be able to share in this conversation, uh, yes. this ongoing conversation around oh. corporate humility. You know, we're here to talk about cultural humility and, and how that might, um, you know, uh, be a really great framework from us, for us to, um, uh, you know, practice what we do in our professional lives. So well, what's cultural humility to you? Cultural humility <laughs> is exactly what you just said there in regards to an ongoing conversation. It's a shared conversation. It's a lifelong conversation. And it really is an opportunity for us to be able to learn about ourselves and others in a proactive, pro-social way. So it really provides scope for us to see diversity and its differences as a source of celebration and strength rather mm -hmm. than a deficit. And it really provides scope for us to then understand how we can utilise those areas of diversity, those differences, as a part of the solution moving together. I really love the way that you you, you emphasize that you know celebration of, of diversity rather than seeing it as a deficit. And I think that that's where we really need to be moving to to improve your know, culturally safe services for First Nations and non-Indigenous people of colour and other minorities who, who we share this beautiful land with. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about why do you think cultural, a cultural uh, humility approach is important? I believe that the cultural humility approach is important because it doesn't just position this idea of the other being learnt about it also positions yourself in that conversation so traditionally cultural competency was all about being the expert of the other those people over there right and we do a two-hour online cultural competency competency course 
And then all of a sudden we'd complete that and feel like we were then the expert again of those people over there. Um, cultural humility really turns that on its head and it creates more of a shared dynamic fluid and flexible approach to diversity. So rather than learning about the stereotypes and the tropes and how you might respond in a, in a professional way, it actually helps us through the cultural humility lens to be aware of our own biases, our own judgments and our own position when it comes to interacting with other areas of diversity. So it helps to call us out in our own perspectives whilst also learning to value diversity in its context, rather than at an arm's length, actually what's happening in space and place. Yeah. To me, learning about self is, is also a commitment to learning about um, the power structures in the mainstream culture within which we are all immersed. We're, mm -hmm. we're swimming in this soup, right, every day. Yes. Um, so I really like cultural humility because it requires us to understand power structures and how they work. Um, and when I work with my students, I ask them about power structures and, and they often, you know, they think of governments, they think of institutions, but we don't tend to think about those more, what I sometimes refer to as ideological power structures. Mm. Um, you know, racism, sexism, or misogyny, um, you know, structures of, of uh, wealth, class, um, and, and uh, sexual um, preferences and, and gender, and all of those um, other structures of power that impact us all. Um, every day, albeit in different ways, depending on who we are. So what about the difference between the concept of cultural humility and cultural safety? Yeah, so there's a couple of things I want to note around the cultural humility and cultural safety, but also what you said there around power structures. So one of the key things that we try and, uh, try and apply in cultural humility is the notion of language and the way in which this notion of dominant discourse. So dominant okay. discourse is that, you know, power structure that you just talked about before and the way in which we use language to either reinforce those discourses or challenge those dominant discourses. So with cultural humility, you're creating scope for us to be aware of structures and power imbalances that may exist in, in space and place. So for example, a doctor-patient relationship. Okay. So a lot of the time doctors will come in and use certain languages to reinforce their particular approach and their dominance in that particular space. But we need to challenge also health professionals to ensure that they're using language that is inclusive of the conversation that they're having with people. And they need to be aware that the language that they're using is one that is shared. So one, a, a classic example is about being able to ensure that when they are speaking with their patients, that they're constantly checking in to ensure that they understand what is being discussed. But even the treatment plan is is actually discussed in a way that is actually inclusive of not just the individual, but the family and the community in which they're located. Now, that is an example also of cultural safety. So by providing scope for people to be understood, not just in their individual context, you're providing health professionals and others supporting them to also understand what is actually happening around them. In Western white medical models, it varies, is very much around the individual and we, we pathologize the individual in the context of their individual uh, illness but we fail to understand that we're beyond just, especially for First Nations communities. So I'm Indigenous to the Pacific, so we have similar perspectives around we, we're not just our own selves, we also belong to a family and community in which we're located. Mm. So cultural safety, as part of that cultural humility context, is all about creating scope for the individual to be understood in their broader context and their other supports that may, that may assist in their well-being and their overall health journey. Now, I know I've just said a lot, but it's that That's great great. conversation around how do we understand these things playing out at different areas as well. You know, one of the things I love about cultural humility is, is the kind of saying that it's okay to not know. 
Yes. And, and I think, you know, that, that the, the notion of cultural competence is, it, you know, implies that we can know the cultural other. Mm. And I often argue that, you know, it, it's an unreasonable expectation. I think that many of us in society don't really fully know our culture and the way that the, the, the mainstream culture that we live in, only we probably understand that. So the idea that we can know the cultural other is, is kind of an impossible goal. So, you know, I really like this idea of, you know, it's okay not to know. So how do we manage that in practice? How do we manage that, you know, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. And I might never be able to know. Yes, that's right. And I think that's one of the key strengths of cultural humility is the ability to be humble uh, right. in the notion of humility, cultural yeah. humility. Yeah. And this idea that you will always be on a learning journey in your interaction with diversity. And I think the other key thing before I unpack that answer further is one of the key things that I'm always keen to ensure we're, we're uh all on the same page around is that cultural humility and cultural diversity isn't just about ethnicity. It's also based on other intersecting identifiers, like, for example, uh, class and religion and age and gender and sexuality and language and ability. So there's all these other intersecting identifiers yep. that we also need to be aware of when it comes to understanding diversity and its differences. And so part of that is to ensure that we're creating scope for us to constantly learn about even those nuances. So you might see an Aboriginal person and you might understand their Indigenous context, but what it does it mean to be from that background also from a gendered point of view? or from this, you know, their sexual preference, or even from their ability, let alone their education and class. Like, there's all these other multiple factors that we have to be aware of. And so one of the best ways, and it's actually quite an easy way to actually uh, engage in this process of being humble, is to ask. If you don't know, ask. So as simple as, oh, what is, or who is, your family, who is in your family? Uh, what languages do you speak at home? Uh, do you have a particular spirituality or faith that you're involved in? Uh, what does this mean to you? Like, what does health mean to you? What does well-being? What supports your understanding of having physical and mental health? Like, just simply asking right. provides a nuanced understanding from the person that you're working with rather than going, oh, because you're from this background then you're going to be like this and because you have that, you're going to be like that. No, ask, be curious, be humble and have that shared conversation. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much so much. I walked off with, walked off with the microphone. Um, thanks very much. I think that's a fantastic um, ending. I'm going to ask the three chairs to huddle around um, the laptop on the table because there's some questions and comments happening there and you'll be able to see that now. Um, so um, the way I see this is that um, the cultural consciousness is, uh, you know, cultural humility comes out of cultural consciousness. So it's more of a an action part from the I'm getting some nods for those that know thank you I've learned this one um so I'm just going to ask you um that my three fantastic chairs to just take a look at what's in the chat and maybe unpack it a little bit more um before we go into breakout rooms to talk about this further Isn't uh, Professor Georgie a wonderful character? Mm -hmm. He's so animated. I yeah. so enjoyed. If you want to Google him, <clears throat> he's done this wonderful TED Talk. And in this TED Talk, he's talking about something different to what we're talking about today. But the first thing he does in his TED Talk is burst into song. <laughs> and, it, it you know, he's got a beautiful voice and he sings a song. And I was just so taken with his energy and enthusiasm. So I felt very privileged to have a conversation with him. 
Um, from the chat boxes so far, it seems there's a lot of agreement in the room um, around um, some discomfort around the concept of cultural competency. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really, really glad to, to um, have that agreement. I, I felt uncomfortable mm -hmm. um, about the, the concepts of cultural awareness, although, you know, awareness ain't a bad thing, right? Mm. And, and so I think what cultural humility suggests to us is that learning about the cultural other is a productive and important thing to do, mm. but it's not enough on its own. No. And that we 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 must also um, raise our awareness, like we said in, in the video, raise our awareness about the, the, the cultural um, context within which we're all immersed mm. and impacts us all every day. Um, and so it kind of balances that out mm. and... Um, and I think, you know, oh, time's up. The critical, um, <laughs> yeah, we've, we've got some nice signs here. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, the critical approach it allows or affords us the opportunity to, to do those things. Mm. It's like being at the Oscars. I'm, so, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, time's up. The reason time's up is we will need to break out into the rooms and there'll be more, you know, within the Q&A at the end, there'll be more opportunities to unpack these things and yes now I feel really embarrassed <laughs> so um when you go online when you go into your breakout room you will be assigned um randomly automatically if you have already been with that table host we're going to ask you to um go down uh, to leave the breakout room and we will assign you I think is that okay Izzy we will assign you to a new breakout room that you haven't been to, um, hopefully, crossed fingers. It's our attempt at networking whilst doing important conversations. So I think, are we ready to go out? Yes, we're ready. Hold on to your hats. We're all going to go out into breakout rooms. And okay, I think we're back in the room. I still feel that, is it, is it okay in the room? It's not, okay, great. Hello, welcome back to the best organized <laughs> blended event ever. Um, okay, so what I want the table host to do now is to post your question in the chat. You probably already started to do that um, whilst I was messing around. Um, so all the table hosts, please post your question in the chat. Um, at the front, we've got our three uh, chairs who are going to huddle around and check the chat. Ready, so that's fantastic. And can you? <laughs> we have. That's great. So we can see you, and um, you need to unmute. No, are you need. Are you good to go? Sorry. Yeah. Just make sure we can see you all in the picture. Um, which is next to the one in green. Okay, off you go. <laughs> so I'm going to first address table eight, wherever you are, um, your question for some clarification around the distinction between cultural safety and cultural humility. Um, so I describe cultural safety as a, a philosophy of practice, um, and it's a goal that we pursue. So as a practitioner, for example, I can't claim to practice cultural safety. Cultural safety is something that only can be defined by the people I'm servicing, by the communities I'm working with or the individual I'm working with. Um, what might be culturally safe for one person in one context might not be for another and what might be culturally safe for a person um, in, in this context might not be for the same person in a different context. So cultural safety is a goal that we're pursuing. Cultural humility, on the other hand, I refer to as a practice framework that gives us the strategies and the practices to be able to pursue cultural safety. Does that help to answer your question, Table 8? I've got no idea where all the tables are. There you are. 
Mm. Would you like to do that one, Joe? The disability. Okay, so we have a, a question um, from table 11, that disability and neurodiversity is often less considered when discussing cultural identity. Mm. How can we do this better? And I was actually on, on the table, <laughs> 11. Um, uh, and we are all a, a mixture of different, different identities. So we're, I guess, here talking about our, our cultures as in the the social identity almost that we grew up in but there are multiple other identities that we are as well so how do you how do you work with those those sort of intersection of those um and we we're talking um was talking with Celine Dion <laughs> just down there <laughs> you can break into song anytime um, and um, because Celine delivers a unit on disability and decolonizing practices. And so this is actually at the heart of, uh, of that unit and of the range of uh, people with lived experience who contribute. Um, Celine, did, did you want to add anything just very briefly? Sorry, run. <laughs> I think she would be a good person to contribute, Celine. Yep. Yeah, look through that. Okay. Oh, hello. Um, multiple mediums here. Um, yeah, I, one of the things I was sharing in my group was how in teaching the second year undergraduate OTs about cultural identity, we teach them about the idea of intersectionality and we give them a little intersectionality identity wheel and then there's a like different axis of um, ways of identifying as kind of just a way for them to enter into this conversation and to start to better understand what culture means to them. Alongside that, we get them to also do the National Centre for Cultural Competency modules. So they have to complete all of them for this unit of study. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different things woven into this unit of study. One of them is critical reflection. And as applied science, um, <laughs> health professional educators, that's sometimes tricky for us, that social science piece. So I already picked Marcel's brain to how how we can better do this and how we can better equip our students to engage in that practice of critical reflection yeah because I always want answers and actions okay. thank you um there's one there's another one that I'd love to try and tackle it's a big one table four how do we develop systems that enable us to make change so we are less reliant on individuals doing the work so this is I suppose how do we even start to address these structural societal issues? Um, they can often feel very defeating and, and just too big. And I might just give an example of um, some curriculum that we have at Monash University that's been developed by the Gukwandruk Indigenous Health Unit um, in our faculty. It's called Allies in Indigenous Health. Um, and it's based on true stories. It's based on incidences of racism that Aboriginal people experience in our healthcare system. Um, and also um, uh, about Auntie Tanya Day who died in custody. And there was a series of events that um, led to her death, including health professionals, paramedics, nurses. Um, so that's a, you know, a huge institutional issue in terms of our healthcare system, our prison systems, these big structural issues that lead to um, Aboriginal deaths and Aboriginal health inequity. Um, and we bring that right up front and centre to our students. We teach them the realities of our healthcare system, our settler colonial healthcare system. Um, and we actually have a case, um, and this is Allies in Indigenous Health, they, they work in interprofessional groups. So they, um, you know, there's always medical students because there's so many of them, but we have all of our health professions working groups of eight and they actually have to respond. There's a, there's a case, it's a young Aboriginal um, sports person and she twists her ankle um, out in public. And then there's just a cascade of racist incidences, institutional and interpersonal race, racism that she encounters and she writes a letter of complaint to the hospital and the students actually have to work together to respond to that letter of complaint. So that requires a lot of research, a lot of um, grappling. And then um, another task that they have to do is they actually have to work on hospital policy so it doesn't happen again. 
So in groups of eight, they actually um, work on that. Um, and the way that it's modelled is um, we've got these things called ISAP cases where they actually get an expert response. So they have a go first. So they have a go at writing, addressing the letter of complaint. And then they actually get um, what would be a really great example of addressing a letter of complaint that's written by Professor Karen Adams um, and Peter from the Gukwandrook unit, written by Aboriginal experts. Um, so they work through that and grapple with it. Um, and part of my, my job now is helping to evaluate that. And I'm also working on um, some longitudinal evaluation as well of our students who are graduated into working into these racist healthcare systems. And if um, allies has had an impact, if they've witnessed um, both interpersonal and structural racism and what have they done about it? And if, if anything, so... That's just one example I can think, a practical example of how we can um, move on from that individual more to that structural um, and getting our students to see that and to start to act against it. Any others? <laughs> There's lots of questions coming up. They're all such fantastic questions. We're running out of time for this session, but I just wanted to, Lynn, if it's all right, talk about what we spoke about, about um, addressing some of this after. Yes. yes. Yeah. So if we don't get to your question right now, we are going to look at this and we're going to share, well, we're going to share some outcomes from today. We're going to share what some of our um, questions and answers. And so some of the questions that have not been answered um, will be. And the other thing I'd like to say is that when we move into thinking about critical allyship, I think some of the same issues and some of the same queries might come up again. So if they do, we might we might be addressing them then. Um, so we'll try our best to um, unpack some of these more for you. But I think it's these are, are really key questions. So I think we'll move on to our next video because as I say, things are, you know, we're on a quite a tight time. Um, I don't think that Stephanie Nixon is online at the moment, but she was with us earlier on. Um, she works at Queen's University in Canada. And well, it was Julia um, who, who alerted me to this video and she sent it to me through email and said, check this out. And when I watched it, uh, something happened to me that was very dramatic. I actually understood um, critical allyship like 10 times better than I'd even thought I did understand it before. And I thought I understood it anyway. So I feel that, um, when, and then I thought we have to play this. It's a 23 minute video, so we, we can't play that. But we're playing the first um, quarter of an hour of the video because honestly, that quarter of an hour will go really fast and you will get um, a really cool uh, understanding of the, um, the construct um, that we're going to be um, looking at next. Um, so if well, I think we're ready, I'm just looking to see if we are ready. So uh, I'm going, no, no, it's not, is it? Yes, sorry, I think this is the one, isn't it? This is the this is the video next. We've got two videos from Stephanie. So I was just slightly like, oh, is it the right one? Yes, it is the right one. That's my bad. Um, and um, yeah, we'll pass you over to Stephanie who says it's so much better than than I can say it. Oh, has she? Oh, so I've just heard that Stephanie's here and um, you're here just in time, Stephanie, to see us playing your um, video. So a big wave. Hi to Stephanie. I really appreciate this video. Thank you. I am a white settler of English and Irish ancestry joining you from land that is the traditional territory of many indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, 
Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples. This land, now known as Toronto, is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island. How I am structured in this history matters for allyship. So let's begin. For a treatment to be effective, it requires getting the diagnosis right in the first place. The right treatment for the wrong diagnosis can exacerbate the very problem you're trying to address, despite one's intention to make it better. This is your tip for effective allyship. That allyship is a treatment designed to address a problem. It's embraced by people like me with good intentions, but it's not intent that matters, it's impact. And often our efforts in the name of allyship make matters worse in ways that are both visible and invisible to us. So we need to go upstream to re-examine our diagnosis of the problem in the first place. Because once we get the diagnosis right, it opens up a world of powerful possibilities for practicing critical allyship. So what is this diagnosis? How ought we to understand the problem that allyship is trying to address? I'm going to answer this question, but it's crucial that we all understand that the ideas I share here are not mine and they are not new. They're not mine and they're not new. I may offer new ways of translating these ideas, but the ideas themselves derive from a genealogy of Black and Indigenous thinkers. And my understanding of these ideas, which is still developing, is thanks to the present day carriers of these wisdoms. And especially these two medical educators, anti-racism leader, Lana James, and Dene artist, Lisa Boivin. So back to our question, how ought we to understand the problem that allyship is trying to address? Let me start with a story. I found out I was white when I was 28 years old. I was in a first year master's class in public health. I'd been working as a physiotherapist with the HIV program in a Toronto hospital for five years. I had a long history of being involved in social justice efforts. The prof asked us to reflect on the social forces that had shaped our health. My classmates talked about growing up poor, being South Asian or being black. And as it came to my turn, I felt embarrassed. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't have anything to offer here. I'm, I'm not anything, I'm, I'm just normal. I'm just normal. But of course I wasn't nothing. I was middle class, I was of English and Irish ancestry, and importantly, I was and I am white. So the question becomes, how was it possible for me to see these social locations as nothing? What assumptions had to be in place for me to see my whiteness as just normal? beyond naming, just the default or standard. I realize now that it required a dangerous misunderstanding of racism, that racism is something only between individuals, only done by people who are bad and who do it intentionally. I saw myself as none of these. And by being socialized to misunderstand racism in this way, I had never been called to understand my whiteness, how it's connected historically to the structure of racism and what it means for my own anti-racist allyship. This unlearning has led me to now understand racism and other systems of inequality using the metaphor of a coin. Let me explain. The coin metaphor has three parts, and it goes like this. There are historic structures that have led to norms and patterns in society that work for or against certain groups of people, but which are unrelated to individual merit, 
or behavior. These are unfair social structures. The isms, I call them systems of inequality. And in this metaphor, each system of inequality is conceptualized as a coin. These coins are societal. They were here before we were born. They have structured society's institutions, our fields, even ourselves. We don't get to opt out of them. We are part of society, raised within these institutions. For each coin, we find ourselves either on the top or the bottom, not by choice or because of merit, but because of who we happen to be the color of skin we happen to have, whom we happen to love. If who we happen to be aligns with this historic system of domination and subordination, then you're on the top of the coin and you get an unearned advantage. You didn't ask for it. You might not even know you're getting it. If who you happen to be does not align with the expectations of this coin, you find yourself on the bottom. You receive an unearned disadvantage. You did nothing to earn it. And you usually know full well that you're getting it. I call the top of the coin privilege. And I call the bottom of the coin oppression. Importantly, there's not one coin for all privilege or all oppression. Rather, there are many, many coins that intersect, creating unique arrangements of advantage and disadvantage, depending on context. We are all on the top of some coins and the bottom of other coins at the exact same time. This is the concept of intersectionality. Advanced by Black scholars Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins, originally introduced to address the intersecting forms of oppression experienced by women who are Black. That is, the intersection of the coins of sexism and racism. Where we find ourselves on the top or bottom of these coins and how they intersect, it matters dearly. It matters because it shapes who's healthy, who's ill, who's injured, who accesses health care, the kind of care they get. These coins influence and sometimes determine who lives and who dies, also known as the avoidable health inequities. And it's not just health outcomes. They also produce avoidable inequities in higher education, our careers, our vastly different experiences with the justice system, and on it goes. So let's fine tune our analysis of thinking about equity across the coin. First, put your attention to the bottom of the coin and answer this question in your own mind. What are the common terms we have for groups whose outcomes are worse due to the unearned disadvantage they receive by finding themselves on the bottom of the coin? What do we call those groups? It's terms like marginalized populations, disadvantaged communities, high-risk groups, vulnerable populations, at-risk populations, hard to reach, hard to serve, priority communities, key neighborhoods, and on and on it goes. Now, put your attention to the top of the coin. What are the parallel terms we have for people whose outcomes are better? because of the unearned advantage they receive by virtue of finding themselves on the top of a coin. If you can't think of any, I agree. Even terms we might imagine are clunky, such as unfairly advantaged communities or free lift populations. We don't have a vocabulary to describe the top of the coin. In fact, my experience has been that when we talk about equity, we frequently disappear the top of the coin. And I'll go a step further. Often when we talk about equity, we don't just disappear the top of the coin. We disappear the coin itself. And all that's left is the bottom of the coin. This is the wrong diagnosis of the problem. Why? 
Why is it so counterproductive, so dangerous, so harmful to frame equity as exclusively the terrain of the bottom of the coin? I'm going to give you two reasons. First, what we frame as the problem sets the universe of possible solutions that will follow. If we frame the problem as the bottom of the coin, we will only come up with solutions to address that part of the problem and not the problem of the coin or the problem of the top of the coin. And a second powerful reason this misdiagnosis is so harmful. And tune in here, because if we can get this, it opens up a world of possibility. It's harmful because of how it allows people like me, who find herself on the top of most coins, to understand my relationship to that system of inequality. How I am encouraged to see my motivation for my justice or equity work. How I get to understand myself in this work. And that is, by disappearing the top of the coin, it removes me from the page entirely. It allows me to see myself as disconnected, as neutral, which allows me to frame my motivation as altruistic, as generous, oriented to save or help those poor people on the bottom of the coin, as opposed to what I really am, which is part of the system of inequality. We don't get to opt out of these coins. I'm not unconnected or neutral. I am complicit. And I'm not saying I'm a bad person, right? This isn't about my goodness or badness. It's understanding that because of who I happen to be, when I find myself on the top of a coin, I am structured in history to be an active agent in upholding that system of inequality until I see it and act differently to interrupt my complicity. That's the path to effective allyship. So this is the misdiagnosis, framing the problem that needs fixing as the bottom of the coin, when it's really the coin that is the intersecting systems of inequality and the misorientation of people on the top of the coin who sustain these systems of inequality day in and day out in our clinics and hospitals, labs and classrooms. This misdiagnosis is not an accident. It is a technique of the systems of inequality to mobilize people like me on the top of coins to uphold these systems. This misdiagnosis tricks us into thinking that the goal of equity, diversity, and inclusion work is to diversify the systems we've got with more people from the bottom of the coin, as opposed to dismantling the coins that are bad for all. That's the problem that needs fixing. So what are these coins? What are their logics of oppression? How is my field or institution complicit? How am I complicit? Because once we can see it, we can interrupt it. We can practice critical allyship. What might this mean or look like? Let's return to the story of 28-year-old me. When it came to my turn, I said, I'm sorry, I'm not anything, I'm just normal. Which takes us to the question, what assumptions had to be in place for me to see my whiteness as just normal? In fact, what is this called when whiteness is taken as the norm, the default, the standard against which all else is measured? It's called white supremacy white supremacy. And I'm not talking here about white supremacists, individuals who intentionally promote whiteness as a power structure. No, I'm referring to white supremacy, the political, economic, and cultural system that has shaped our societies, our fields, and all of us in them, whether or not we're white. The Human Genome Project confirmed what many already knew that neither whiteness nor blackness are valid scientific constructs, that they've always been and remain social. 
They are social ideas based on different colors of skin, textures of hair. And it's crucial to understand that race didn't come first. Racism did. That there have always been people with different colors of skin and textures of hair, but this was not viewed in terms of superiority and inferiority until people who had skin that looks like mine invented the idea of race. Why? Because it was the method by which Europeans operationalized the quest for economic growth and power through European colonial conquest and the transatlantic slave trade and created what's now a global myth of superiority and inferiority to justify the dehumanization and exploitation of people with darker skin. So history matters for each of these coins and how each of us is structured in that history, especially for the coin of racism. Racism isn't something only between individuals that only bad people do on purpose. It's a coin, a historic, social structure that gives unearned power and access to resources at a global, regional, and personal level to people who are deemed to be white or who have proximity to whiteness and denies, limits, and obstructs access to power and economic opportunities for people who are not deemed to be white. And this occurs along a gradient that positions blackness at the bottom, hence producing the unique coin of anti-black racism, which is global and local, of which we are all part. Complicit was the word that I obviously um, edited off of, the, <laughs> off of the video. Um, thanks again to, uh, yeah, I think. Thank you again to Stephanie. I don't know if Stephanie's still online. Great. We have another um, 10 minute video and then we're going to have a, you know, a two or three minutes to kind of discuss the issue um, of uh, effective allyship. And before we go into the breakout groups. So if you're still online, Stephanie, we we'll, might invite you to say a couple of words about that based on some of the things in the chat. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce a conversation that was recorded between Alison Crack Francis Cracknell and um, Julia. And this conversation was actually recorded before we introduced the Stephanie Nixon video. We were, you know, uh, it wasn't our kind of intention to do both, but I did feel that both they both fitted together really well. And so, um, so it's Julia McCartan, our chair, and Alison um, Cracknell, Francis Cracknell, I'm getting it all wrong. Um, and they're going to talk again about effective uh, allyship. Yeah. Okay, so I'd like to begin by doing an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which we're meeting from today. I'm on the land of the people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, and Alison, what whose lands are you joining from today? Hi, thanks, Julia. Um, uh, yeah, I'm the, similar to you. I'm on the land of the people of the Kulin Nations, and I'd like to pay my respect as well um, and extend that to elders past and present. And Let's just begin by sharing a little bit about ourselves and how did we get to having this conversation about critical allyship today? Would you like to start, Alison? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, it's a good question. How did I get to be having this conversation with you today? Um, well, first of all, I guess I wouldn't I wouldn't claim to be an ally. I, I see it as a something that I'm striving towards and working on and a very active process that I'll be working on probably for a long time. So I don't know if anything I say today provides any answers about it, but it's just my own personal experiences, I guess, of my journey so far. Yeah. So um, so my background is physiotherapy and I work at Monash Uni in the physio department there. And my major role is overseeing clinical education. 
um, but I'm also completing doctoral, doctoral studies with Professor Karen Adams, with um, who heads up Monash's Gukwandaruk Indigenous Engagement Unit. And I've, yeah, it's a really um, fortunate opportunity that I've got. And we're looking at um, non-Indigenous educators teaching Indigenous health in health professional education, mm -hmm. um, taking a critical look at that. And um, yeah, it's a really huge learning journey for me and it's a, a privilege to be doing it together. Yeah, um, so uh, together with Alison, I also had Professor Karen Adams as my PhD supervisor and we've both learnt so much from her. And she set, on, set us on a really quite unique learning journey, I think, for um, two non-Indigenous people. Um, and I remember, Alison, back at pre-pandemic, just like the across the conference, which is the Australian Critical Race um, and Whiteness Studies Association Conference. And I know that there were some speakers there that resonated really strongly with the both of us. I know we've spoken about that quite a lot over the next few years um and yeah uh, similarly to you um I think it was a real light bulb moment for me too just being able to be at that conference and really hear strong voices saying it's you know time for non-Indigenous people to step up and and as you say do some of the heavy lifting in this space and I think that um the research journey that you and I have both been on has been trying to emulate a, that call, I'd say, yes. um, and trying to figure out well, what does that mean and how do we do that appropriately without overstepping our place within that. Um, and I would also say my other supervisor, Dr Mandy Trong, she's also been really instrumental in guiding my, my learning in that space as well. Mm. So I think, yeah, very pivotal moment and you know it's not an easy space to work in and to and to try and get it right and you know we're we're at high risk of getting it wrong and I think that's part of we need to accept that we're going to make mistakes um whether we mean to or not the fact is we probably will but we need to be able to respond when we do and learn and not continue to make the same mistakes at other people's expense yep excellent point Alison and I think I might just reflect on um, a poem that Karen has shared with us um, by an American poet, poet Andre Lord. Um, and it really quite resonates now that um, I've had many conversations with Karen um, about, I suppose, the labor that she's expected to do as an Aboriginal professor. Um, and part of this poem is, those who profit from our oppression call upon us to share our knowledge with them in other words, it is the responsibility of the oppressed to teach the oppressors their mistakes. The oppressors maintain their position and evade responsibility for their own actions. There is a constant drain of energy which might be better used redefining ourselves. Well, yeah, it's yeah, wise words. And I think I'm just thinking about some of the key learnings for me so far um, while undertaking my research. and. Yeah, I think for me, it's that deep realisation that this is an ongoing effort, um, it's going to require uh, commitment, um, it, it's not easy, and it, yeah, it's a, it's an ongoing journey. Um, and I think recognition that even though I'm actively trying to work in this space, I also am part of the problem, and, it, and, and that remains so. Mm. And so just being aware of that um, and... Yeah, I guess acknowledging that and, and understanding my position um, in the struggle for justice and equity in health yes. is important, I think. Um, I think it takes time, it takes trust as well. Yes. You know, I think when we work in academia or maybe in healthcare institutions or healthcare providers, there's often a push to, you know, get things done or spend this funding or mm. finish this project. But Hit these metrics. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I think for me... I've I've realised that what's more important is getting it right mm -hmm. and yes we need to change things and get that work done but we've got to do it the right way not just in a rush yes um and also I think for me having friends for that journey has been really important as well so mm -hmm. finding some collaborators to do that reflexive practice together exactly and I think that's the whole point of today's session up in Sydney is to create that space for safe praxis and um, reflexivity amongst um, 
largely a group of non-Aboriginal people and how does this inform health professions education? Um, and also, I suppose with my PhD, um, I also um, had a focus on non-Indigenous, non non-Aboriginal people and that choice to hold the mirror up to non-Indigenous people was really due to my reading in the critical literature, the critical methodologies, critical Indigenous scholarship as well. Um, and it really opened my eyes up to something that I had never even realised before. Um, the fact that ongoing settler colonisation in Australia is transparent and often invisible, and that is why what makes it powerful. Um, and that's um, a key role for critical allies is actually deciphering and understanding the key roles that we have and the complicity that we have in these processes and structures of settler colonization um, before we go and you know what you were saying Alison often you, you do things quite quickly but this is like a lifelong ongoing learning journey um, and you know, really there is not enough um, literature and not enough research where non-Indigenous health practitioners and health professionals do this sort of work, do this critical praxis work, reflect on their ongoing power and positioning, and then research ourselves as non-Indigenous people. So yeah, that's that's. I know that Karen really was that, the mentor for both you and I to really flip the narrative and, and and have that as the focus for our PhDs. Yeah, and I'm just thinking about that invisibility of those settler colonial structures and processes that invisible to people like you and I, but probably oh, obvious to, to those who are not on the advantageous end of those things. Of um, course, that's a very good point, Alison. Yeah, and I think that's what it's easy for us to, to forget that, even those of us that are trying to remember. It, it's mm. very, oh, yes. it's very it's hard work to try and pay attention to that um yes. and I think you know you and I have both read the work of Stephanie Nixon and her principles of critical allyship which I know I've found really helpful and um particularly that that point about stepping back mm. and also amplifying mm. um Indigenous voices to be truly working on work that's led by First Nations people yes yeah which yeah. is it countercultural to working you know in the academy um that stepping back you know normally we're told to step up and you know apply for your awards and get those accolades yes but actually what we need to do is something different in this space um is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up Alison um well only look thanks it's been it's it's always good to talk about these things uh with a with a friend who's you know on the similar journey I think probably the final thing maybe to say is that as healthcare professionals, we've really got to learn to listen. Mm. You know, we're trained to make decisions and set goals and lead the way, but actually we really need to learn to listen and not just listen, but actually hear what, what Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are saying um, and really learn to work with that, with them leading the way. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Alison. I'll, I'll leave um everyone with that very important point yes. <laughs> and I would like to say thanks to Alison and, and after the event we'll be sending a, a big thank you to her for for joining in our conversations because I feel that every time I hear a conversation about the issues I think it clarifies things for me better um, I also want to say thanks to Gloria for posting the poem link in the chat. We'll be actually putting the poem up in our lunch break, I think, won't we? Yeah, we got the full poem coming up in the lunch break um, on a roll because I actually felt that that poem was was great. So thanks to Julia for sharing that one with me um, too. Um, and I'm just going to invite Marcel to say a couple of things about you know, critical allyship before we uh, maybe ask Stephanie to, to say a couple of things too. Um, yeah, critical allyship is something that makes me excited. Um, it's a difficult space to work in. It's a collaborative space. 
Um, and I think it really, you know, what I hear continually emphasised throughout um, Julia and Alison's discussion was the need to take time. So I think, you know, we, we know about the concept of slow food. Yeah, <laughs> this is the concept of slow scholarship. We cannot rush this process. We cannot be patient with one another in this process. And we, we, we've got to support each other in this process. So coming from my perspective as an Aboriginal um, person, I'm really excited to, to work in this space as a support for my non-Indigenous colleagues. And I think it's a, a really worthwhile uh, thing to be working on. And, and I hope to be still um, working on it when, when I'm in my 80s. Right? <laughs> so this, this is the kind of commitment I think that's necessary for critical allyship. Thanks, Marcel. Thank you. Uh, is Stephanie still online? Do you have there? Oh, fantastic. Hi, Stephanie. Lovely to see you. Well, I just feel like the luckiest person in the world. What a beautiful gathering that you have here. And thank you so much for the way that you brought in some of the ideas that I've been trying to translate. You saw in that video, those ideas aren't mine. So let's not get any, anyone uh, fooled here to think that these are original. This is These are just translation exercises. So yeah, I wanted to say so, so thanks so much. And do I have time to offer a, a, a just a short reflection about critical allyship? Yes, yes, please do. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to offer, you know, uh, as a white settler woman, and I'm a work in progress, right? This will be forever work trying to figure out what's my work to do, uh, given how I'm structured in history. And I wanted to share that in the few years since I've published that paper using the language of critical allyship, the more I understand the ideas that underpin it, the less I'm convinced that I got the language right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, critical allyship, if, if, if it maps to the ideas that we're talking about here, then that's great. Let's stick with it. But the more that I'm able to understand that what we need, what I need to be doing uh, is shifting away from the mentality I've been taught, which is that my work is to save and fix and help others and move instead towards that I need to be helped and fixed and saved in the spirit of collective liberation. You know, Audre Lorde, again, this is hers and other uh, black feminist ideas here around, you know, we all need to get free. This is about all of our liberation bound up together. The more I'm drawn to terms like co-liberator, you know, ally has so much wrapped up in it around being nice, do unto others that I think it I think it distracts us. And even as much as I tried to draw it away, talking about practicing critical allyship, it gets us partway there. But I, I just wanted to share that I've been um, more drawn to language like acting in radical solidarity or this idea of co-liberatorship, uh, which I heard about from uh, an African-American physician uh, named Dr. Uh, Nodine Opara, and I've just put a link to her Twitter, Twitter handle in the chat box as well. So I just wanted to invite that provocation to say, I'm even rethinking uh, while I'm on my own journey here, um, what's our work to do and, and how do we language it to not let us fall back into the, the, the ruts of white supremacy and colonization that continuously teach me that my job is to help other people when that's not it at all, it's to get free. Thank you so much. And I'm just going to share with you, there are nods in the room. Um, and I'm going to invite Julia to say something because she just was saying, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> what an honor, Stephanie, to meet you online and just having read your work and cited it in my PhD. Alison cited you in her PhD. Um, you're a big, big person at Monash University without even realizing it. Um, and I just love that. I know the term allyship is fraught. Um, so I've written down co-liberator. I'm like going to research that in more detail. I, 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 um, I, I really like your framing there. I'm too very interested in language. Um, and I think what you said resonates as well as we all need to get free. And these systems of inequality, these coins that you, you um, eloquently describe, um, oppress people at the top of the coin too. Not as much as at the bottom of the coin, but I'm just thinking of patriarchy. Patriarchy is harmful to men as it is to women. So this bounded up liberation of everybody by focusing on these systems and structures is an, another really interesting concept um, with co-liberation, critical allyship that I'd love to unpack further. So thank you, Stephanie. 
Thanks, Julia. Now we are pushed for time, so we're going to get straight into the breakout room. Um, we've now got, um, can, the, can the hosts, the table hosts, please post any questions or queries or what have you in the chat, please. And I'm going to invite um, our three chairs to huddle around the table at the front and to kind of um, check out those qu queries and questions and um, you, and yeah, and, and respond to them. So I'm just checking to see it has anyone, well, we'll give people a moment to put the questions in. I'm hurrying you along, aren't I? <laughs> Tell me to stop. <laughs> I also want to share with you while the hosts are now um, popping their questions in the chat, I just got some impromptu feedback from someone in the room. I'm not going to name names or anything, but they said, this is really eye opening. And that has made me, my, that has made my day because if one person has felt this is eye opening, that's enough, you know, and I'm pretty sure that, that they're not the only person. So, um, that's just the best feedback ever. Are we, are we do any do we have any questions? Oh, we've got questions popping up in the chat now. Um, and I'll hand you over to our our chairs to respond. Um, we, a question that we can see is how do we capture nuance and be sensitive to lived experience of oppression in spaces where we address systemic inequality in classrooms and in healthcare? How do we avoid perpetuating further harm and power imbalances? It's really um, delicate um, balance. So I really um, want to talk about this today and I'll just reflect being, you know, demonstrating some humility of catching myself in the classroom. Um, and um, it was actually after just sharing the Stephanie's um, coin model. And I became very cognizant of who I was teaching um, and our cohorts, probably at least 33% international students. So even using terminology like white supremacy and um, have to be very careful because um, we have very intersecting um, you know, experiences of privilege and oppression in all of the classrooms that we're teaching and all of the health services that we're working in. Um, so I caught myself then when I, I, you know, was referring to settler colonisation and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, but I um, actually um, recognised who was in the room with me, um, and I'm not sure my exact language, but I made reference to the fact that we had such diversity in our cohort, in our room, um, and then paid, um, re you know, respected that there's various forms of racism that occur. Um, we, 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 the topic was also racism, anti-racism. And we, we, this is a common um, uh, question that gets asked um, is, um, if what about other forms of racism? What about the very real racism that occurs? Um, anti, you know, um, Asian racism um, in Melbourne. Lots of um, racism against South Sudanese people as well. And I never want this education to negate those very real experiences of racism occurring to all you know, other cultural groups as well. Um, but I, I do highlight that because of settler colonization, there are very unique um, experiences and ongoing experiences of racism um, that affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And we need to be teaching our future health professionals about other forms of prejudice and racism as well. Um, so that was just 
a little example there about being mindful of um, the potential to marginalize um, our um, um, students um, and to always be cognizant and be humble in that as well. Um, so that's my little reflection there. Um, I would agree with that very much. And you have, when you have a classroom as we do at University of Sydney, you have a lot of international students and being aware, and a lot of people who are first generation from around the world, and being very aware of um, their cultural background, my lack of understanding of their cultural background, my, you know, the, the navigating all of that is another another intersection. People come at this work around working with as a settler colonial um, context with Aboriginal people from very different backgrounds, and it's very complex, nuanced. And I'm I still feel I need just starting to skate the surface and often reflect, well, what did I say mm. that I, you know, how did I talk about this? And uh, I actually was going to raise it this week in, um, in one of our um, classes talking about history matters for Aboriginal people. It's about the experience during COVID in Sydney of some communities in Sydney um, and during the lockdowns and how safe do they now feel around um, the systems in Sydney and in Australia. How safe do they feel around health systems and police systems in the army, given that what happened sometimes in some communities? Mm. And I just want to very quickly um, respond to uh, a post from Table Ten, um, and and they it's, it's rather than questions, it's a set of reflections. I think uh, Priya, where are you guys? I think. Uh, and, and one of the reflections was that the term allyship might be problematic in the sense that it denotes allegiance with camps, groups, and a dis con dissonance. No. Uh, with the concept of working together. And it's interesting that you should reflect that way because we were in um, uh, uh, a group, a breakout group with. Stephanie, yep, and she talked about mm. since she made that film about um, critical allyship, she's become less and less comfortable with the term critical allyship. Um, yeah, so I, I think, we, you know, part of the work that we're doing is, is finding the language, mm. you know, is, is thinking about it and defining saying what we mean and meaning what we say and, and, and you know, breaking new ground in the language that we use. So I think it's something for us to ponder on. There's another paper, um, Tricia McGuire-Adams, who's a, um, a First Nations Canadian person who I also cited. And her paper is that it's something like settler allies, settler allyship is earned, it's not self-proclaimed as well. Or well, critical allyship is um, yeah not self proclaimed sorry, um, and in reading that I don't go around calling myself a critical ally. I just do the work and model it um, because from what I've read um, and what I've heard, um, Aboriginal colleagues say is that's up to that's to be determined by Aboriginal peoples if you're an ally or not it's not for us to self-proclaim that I'm an ally I'm doing this so again it links back to cultural humility as well cultural and cultural so everything interlinks mm -hmm. um so that's yeah my reflection too um okay welcome back everybody after the break um so we were thinking about this, we were talk, talking about this during the break, that there is a lot of confusion in terms of terminology that we use, and there's an awful lot of work to be done in that space. But for this afternoon's session, we're going to ask you to park terminology. We're going to ask you to think about the constructs that are underneath those terminologies and the learning that we've been having uh, in terms of understanding our place in in the problem, and um, and so this afternoon is all about what can we do. So we've learned a lot this morning, and and the question now is 
And so what? Um, this afternoon, we're going to do a World Cafe, but I'll talk about that a little bit, you know, near the time. Um, but before we do that, we're going to um, just have a little debrief with our chairs um, about the um, constructs that we talked about this morning. And then we're going to play um, another clip from Stephanie Nixon's video. And in that clip, um, she talks about 10 tips. So she gives us 10 tips. And then to, following that, we'll have a little bit more from Joji. Joji, is that right? Did I get it? I did get it right. Thank you, Marcel. Joji and Marcel, um, because it really, really fits before we move into our World Cafe conversations. So without further ado, I'm going to ask the three chairs to huddle around together again, around the table, and just kind of um, give us a, you know, a, a five minute, six minute reflection on, on the day, really, so far. <laughs> okay, so just um, regrouping my thoughts. <laughs> um, I think it's been a tremendous um, opportunity to talk about the terminology, the theory, and the practice from various people's angles, just to sort of make state the obvious, really, and um, that it's been. Um, it's raised for me certain things that I have learned along the way um, and started to explore more recently, but has highlighted that they are important. They're not just a figment of my imagination mm. or my particular viewpoint that they are shared. Mm. Uh, one example I've sort of got very excited about is time. Um, because I, I have learned and I'm currently on a, I'm on a largish grant that's a nas nationally competitive grant in Australia. Um, working in cardiovascular disease with um, Aboriginal, remote Aboriginal communities. And um, one of the things I've been doing is pushing back on time. If we're going to visit communities, well, we are, because we've got community partners, so we go backwards and forwards, we have to make time to go there and to be there and to make sure there's time for conversation, for flexibility, for leadership at that. We don't know what's happening in communities. So pushing back on time um, is and allowing time to be not only in one's research practice, but also in um, your own practice um, in terms of how you are when you're at work with the students, with curriculum, but also in things like promotion applications, which for me, I just wouldn't do for about a decade because it's not. I could not stand on the shoulders of people who have guided me and led me. And to put your promotion application in on that, I felt was just wrong. Mm. Um, eventually I did. Um, and then I hesitated about the next step for exactly the same reason. That, um, and so I guess that's the other, the other thing about time and about, it's not just about time actually, it's about where you are placed in your career in your relationship mm. to the people that you work with. And that's, for me, it's largely driven still by that rage I had about what I understood and had happened in Australia for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and my complete ignorance about it as a relatively, as a privileged white woman mm. um, and my lack of knowledge. So I guess there are a few mm. random thoughts from today. Yeah. Lots that's... of them I've got, but that's a few. Thank you. I might just sort of build on from that, actually. And this is some of the mental gymnastics that I um, have done and continue to do. And when we're working in this, when I'm working in this space as a, as a, in the critical space, um, and a conversation that I keep having is that tension about critique and centering. <laughs> um, so we're in danger if we're focusing on people at the top of the coin of actually centering them, centering whiteness, centering privilege, um, hence the need for these critical methodologies, which are about critique and action. And that's something that I really had to grapple with for about a year because Karen 
would say you're centering whiteness you're centering whiteness and I'm like but I am white you know it's just this constant grappling um so but in doing that we've sort of um in framing today as it is we're sort of trying to create a space for um uh people who um are settlers people who are um, immigrants, people who aren't First Nations people, to see our key roles in this space. We actually, because what I encounter is often, even some of the talks I've done at Monash, people are like, this is too hard, this is all too much. And that's been written about, about freezing and being overwhelmed and freezing, but we really want to get over that um, and to really delineate a key role that is available to us and it's critical. It's this, these critical ways of working. Um, and then that frees up, and this is what the poem was about, that frees up the time and labour of people who find themselves on the bottom of the coin who are constantly expected to teach us. Um, so that's just a little delineation and why I was so motivated to frame this session all about critical conversations. Listening to both of your feedback, it, it, it strikes me that what we're doing here today and what we hope to continue doing um, in all of our different, you know, um, roles, it's courageous. You know, I think these conversations are courageous conversations. Um, we need to, we're becoming vulnerable and, and that vulnerable space is, is, can be a really creative space. Um, vulnerability, humility, I think they kind of go together. Um, yeah, so, so I'm really, Void, energized, and excited about um, our gathering today and what where we can go from here. And, and I'd just sort of like to remind us that um, you know, this is a lifelong commitment, and that, you know, in the different contexts that we find ourselves, we need to start over each time. Um, you know, if my own experience moving from a space of, you know, in the humanities space, um, moving into the health space, it, it, it really, you know, brought me back down to someone, I, I, and I have to say, I don't know. I joke and say I, I, I didn't know what a myocardial impact was. <laughs> um, oh, you just mean heart attack, right? <laughs> but, you know, that's the kind of vulnerability that I think... Um, makes room, makes space for, for creativity and new ways forward. So, yeah, I think, I think you know, we're it's such a courageous conversation today and, um, yeah, I feel really privileged to have been a part of it. Yeah. And, yeah, we've got more conversations coming up. It's mm -hmm. exciting. That's great. I'm, um, I think I'll take over now if that's okay. Uh, yeah. It sounded like there was a, a proper pause going on. <laughs> um, so first of all, I'd like to say um, we've 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 actually reduced our the the room numbers um, in the session today because we've had obviously it's now quite late at night in Canada, so a lot of our Canadian colleagues are either post dinners or having snoozes and you know ready off to bed and putting the kids to bed and all those other things um so we've had some apologies on that side which is fine and um so we only just to let you know housekeeping we only have six rooms um but that means they're going to be still buzzing um when we put everyone in the rooms now um the next thing that, that's on the agenda is we're going to play another excerpt from Stephanie's video. And this excerpt is the, the end part where she just says the so what, because what we're doing now is we're moving in. As um, Julia has reminded me multiple times, and I, I appreciate this, is that critical, part of critical 
conversations is the critical bit that we actually think about doing something and what does this mean for us in practice. And so we move to the part of Stephanie's video that actually addresses some tips. Um, and then uh, following that, we'll have another excerpt from uh, Marcel and Joti. So are we ready for the excerpt? On Yep, okay, we're all ready to go. I promised earlier that getting the diagnosis right opens up a world of powerful possibilities for practicing critical allyship. So what is it? It is the reorientation for people who find themselves on the top of a coin that they wish to dismantle. Described by the Anti-Oppression Network as an active process of unlearning and reevaluating in which a person on the top of the coin seeks to operate in solidarity with folks on the bottom. And what might this look like in practice? It's people on the top of the coin, like me, abandoning the premise of using our expertise to help marginalized people and instead embracing commitments that include, but are not limited to, these 10 tips for effective allyship. I see and understand my own role in upholding systems of oppression that create inequities. I learn from the expertise of give credit to and work in solidarity with people on the bottom of the coin to help me address these unjust systems. And this includes mobilizing action among other people in positions of privilege. I understand that effective allyship on anti-racism requires that I name, interrupt, and uproot white supremacy and ongoing colonial patterns. Further, I understand that this logic extends to equity, diversity, and inclusion work more broadly which must resist the trend of diversifying within whiteness and move instead to uprooting whiteness as a power structure that intersects so insidiously with other coins. I embrace the fact that this work is fraught and messy. I make mistakes, and when I do, I don't shut down or leave the movement. I apologize. I learn, make amends, and I keep going. I tune into my feelings of guilt and shame, which are designed to shut down progress by once again centering those of us on the top of the coin. And I reframe my guilt as responsibility, responsibility for accountable action because of where I find myself structured in history. I do not burden people on the bottom of the coin to help me process my feelings. Tending to feelings is important, and I will surround myself with people whose intersectional anti-oppression analysis is far more evolved than my own, to both help me in my journey and to hold me to account. I do the work of finding and learning from the deep historical archive that has been gifted to me from Black, Indigenous, and other critical thinkers about how our liberation top and bottom of coin is bound together and how we can all get free. And I avoid the trap of seeing my learning and unlearning as an end in itself. Instead, I am learning in action, focused on redistributing power and resources to give rise to a new set of systems that are better for all. We close with these words passed on by Aboriginal elder Lilla Watson. If you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together.
Okay, some powerful words. But yeah, okay. So I, rather than asking another question, I, I, I just leave the door open. Is there any, you know, last final comments you'd like to make about cultural humility? So I love what you would raise in the, in this conversation around sometimes we will get it wrong and that's okay. It's okay to get it wrong, but learn from that experience, that interaction. There's so many different, like I, I go around the country and talk about cultural humility and there's moments in time where I will stuff it up and go, oh, what did I just say? <laughs> oh, I should know about this. But then in my head, I'm like, no, no, no. Cultural humility is a lifelong journey and it's about me going, what could I learn from my interactions there? I may have used the wrong pronouns. Like how do I then ensure that next time I might not do that again? So yeah. it's about, again, learning and then creating scope. The other key thing is also holding our institutions and, and places of work accountable in the context of that process of change as well. So again, traditionally we think that those people of diverse backgrounds, they need to be different to fit into us mm. as a society. No. How does society and its institutions, including the health system and the legal system, the education system, the welfare system, how do we better respond to those areas of diversity yeah. to ensure that we're creating a sustainable approach as part of our shared uh, solution focus, sustainable outcomes moving forward together? Yeah. Really glad you brought that up. The institutional accountability is is such an important one. It's also a hard one, you know, because we often think, okay, my institution's enormous and I'm on one person. You know, how, how can I encourage accountability? And I think conversations like this, um, like this symposium, you know, carrying on those conversations and sharing um you know, our tips and tricks um, is, is the way that we can do that. So, yeah. Agree, agree. completely agree. Yeah. We're all part of something, right? We, we're all individuals. And that's the thing. We look at culture in these spaces, institutional culture. And the thing is that we've got to remember is that culture is defined by us that live right. within those particular systems and structures. So if we, if we can rally a process of change as a result of being educated around these particular ideas, then we can reshift. A, a classic example is the tobacco um, cessation programs that have happened over the last two or three decades. Gradually now we've changed our views on tobacco usage to the point where we're not really consuming much tobacco anymore. Right. And so if you said that to someone 20, 30 years ago, you know, would get to where we are today and not have so much tobacco usage, people would be like, what are you talking about? No. Yeah. But we're here now, right? Yeah. And so it's a gradual shift and we yeah. want to be part of that gradual shift. Part of the solution, yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Chiorgi, for joining us today. And um, I hope that you and I get the chance to talk again soon. Um, yeah, and I'd love to give you a round of uh, applause, but I noticed that you're a musician. I've heard you sing a beautiful song on TEDx. So I'm a musician too, I'm a singer too. And one of my mantras is don't clap, just throw money. I'm a musician. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So um, I won't clap, but uh, I probably won't throw any money either, but but uh, my heartfelt thanks. And I'm sure everyone at the symposium uh, agrees with that. So bye for now.